All right. Hi, everybody. Um, good afternoon. And on behalf of NAEYC and Teach Plus, I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome you to today's webinar, Beyond Stakeholder Engagement, Centering Early Childhood Educator Expertise in Policymaking. I'm Lauren Hogan. I'm the Managing Director of Policy and Professional Advancement at NAEYC. I'm going to be your MC for this afternoon as we hear from an extraordinary group of leaders in the policy and advocacy and program and philanthropic spaces. All of our presenters are here and in the chat, so please feel free to use the chat and the Q&A functions. I see folks are posting already to ask questions of them and of your peers share resources and ideas and ways in which your organization or your state is centering educator expertise in policymaking. I also want to note that while we aren't talking explicitly about family voice today, these two elements are integrally connected. So we encourage you to share strategies for the engagement and centering of family expertise as well. The truth is that decision-making and policymaking are powerful. That's part of what brings us here today. In the early childhood education field, we have an absolute obligation to confront the marginalization of educators in decision-making processes. This is rooted in decades of racism and elitism that's both internal and external to the early childhood education landscape. In the experience of most educators, policies and recommendations have happened to them, which has resulted in a system that is ostensibly created for them, but functionally operated without them. The deep and significant gap between policy and practice is detrimental to us all. For better and more equitable policy, educators' experiences and knowledge have to be heard and acknowledged in ways that foster authentic and accessible engagement. Educator leadership, as we all know, is transformational, and their engagement in policymaking should be both expected and routine. Any EYC and Teach Plus, along with our affiliates and partners, and of course our members, have worked to make it so. So I am delighted to kick us off today by welcoming Rian Evans Alvin, CEO of NAEYC, and Roberto Rodriguez, President and CEO of Teach Plus, to kick us off. I think they have some questions that they would like to ask of each other. So Rian and Roberto, take it away. Terrific. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, we're so appreciative to be here today and so fun to be here with my friend Roberto Rodriguez, uh, who is uh, just such an advocate for young children and certainly for early childhood educators and teachers. So Roberto, welcome. We're so glad to have you with us. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you today, Rian. Roberto, um, you know, you have always been so passionate about supporting educator leadership. Talk to us about where that comes from and, and kind of why that's been such an important part of your career. Well, you know, I just feel today more than ever the ability for us to usher in the uh, evolution and the changes that we need to see in education depends so greatly on uh, harnessing and elevating and empowering the voices and the vision and the ideas of our educators. Uh, they are the future of our education system, you know, and our ability to deliver on that promise of opportunity for all learners really depends on bringing those ideas and solutions and voices of our, uh, of our educators forward, right? So they've always been, you know, the closest to that opportunity equation. Uh, they are the closest in our schools and centers and communities to those equity gaps in the system. Uh, and, um, we really need to listen to them and put them in the front uh, of, of the, the vision for how we transform our system and our services and our policies for our learners. So I've always been passionate about that, but I think we're um, in, we have a real moment uh, where we're able to uh, think about the role that they play in co-constructing the future of our system. Yeah, so Rian, I'd like to ask you a little bit about, about that and, you know, I. I just respect so much uh, your leadership at NAYC and how you have always valued the voices of your educators, put them front and center in the work. Um, so talk to us a little bit about like how you think about centering educator expertise at NAYC. How do you sharpen that distinction between feedback and versus like a more authentic version for how our, our educators lead? 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Roberta, because when I, I um, have been in this role for about eight years now and came here from Arizona, and part of the what inspired me to go to NACI was the fact that we, we are a professional membership association, and the whole nature of that is that we're centered around our reason for existing is for our members and for early childhood educators. And so everything we do, whether it's the policies we advocate for or the um, content that we produce or the, the, the books that we, we publish um, is about how you elevate and create the space so that just the richness of, of the early childhood education profession is front and center. And it's really interesting to me because when we went through this process um, for more than three years with power to the profession to create the unifying framework, it was really hard to keep everybody, all the other really important voices and constituents on the outside of the circle for a minute to give early childhood educators the time and space to design their own future. And we kind of went into it thinking, well, of course, that's what we're going to do. But but I think what struck me the most, because part of that process, we wound up studying all sorts of other professions, nursing and trade professions like plumbing and construction and speech pathology. And the biggest difference between those professions and early childhood education, and I would say teaching too, is that they are, um, they, they write that you don't pass legislation in the state without the nurses at the table. Like you just, you don't do it or you'll hear about it and it's bad. And I just, it was so alarming to me during that process to see the difference in those professions and the kind of practice autonomy that those professions have. And then what little practice autonomy teachers have. And it's like, everything seems to be done to them and regulations, they're the recipient of policy, not the creator of policy. And I think, so part of power of the profession was to kind of flip the script and to have early childhood educators create their destiny to say, what do you want for your professional field of practice? And then we'll back into the model legislation and the regulation to do that. And it, so it's kind of this notion of early childhood educators in the center of the concentric circles rather than the outside looking in with like the regulators and the government as the center of the system. And it was, it was very different for us. And I learned that it's to do it well, it's, it's like grassroots organizing. It is, if people think, oh, well, we're gonna grassroots organize it. It's complex work and it's so important. Like it is so important that we hold ourselves accountable for those kinds of conversations and spaces because otherwise we can have all the rhetoric about valuing educators and they're, the, they're essential, all the things we say, but then when they see how it all actually shows up, it feels very different to them. And so I think it's, I think it's really important to create that, um, that distinction. Um, so I'm curious about Teach Plus and how do, how do you as an organization support educator engagement um, in the work that you do? Yeah, well, I think it's, uh, you know, we share so many common values, Rian, with um, NAEYC and in terms of how we think about this. And I just am so compelled as you describe power to the profession because we believe that leadership has to be an inherent part of that profession. It is not a nice to do, it has to be a must have for both how we exercise the expertise of our educators across the country in the here and now, but also for what how we build forward, how we build a stronger uh, profession and provide those opportunities for our educators to leverage their expertise and their voice toward change. Um, so I just I think uh, you know what what you've created there and, and how you've described it around really putting teachers at the center, but also providing greater agency, right for our for our teachers to use their voices. It's a lot of a lot of what we do at Teach Plus as well. You know, we believe that the development and exercising of teacher leadership is a must-have in the profession, and we work with nearly 800 uh, teacher leaders around the country in 11 states uh, every year to grow their skills to be effective communicators and to research and synthesize and use data and evidence. Um, but we also, more than anything, help them become bilingual in policy and in practice. And so we think about this as a kind of common language, right? And there's a moment that I think uh, 
many of our teacher leaders have in whether it's in our policy fellowship or in the work that we do in our schools, coaching and supporting our teachers to lead their peers uh, with their principles toward change, uh, where they recognize and step into their full potential to lead outside of the four walls of that center or the four walls of that, of that classroom and to advocate and exercise that leadership uh, with their peers you know, in their building or in their center or, what, or with system leaders, you know, and connecting with uh, governors or state legislators or other uh, uh, system leaders to um, make change. Um, so it's a really exciting, it's very exciting work. Uh, and I believe it is work that is necessary for how we reframe our education system moving forward, for how we really deliver on that equity imperative. Because again, as I was saying, I, our teachers are at the they're, they're at that opportunity equation. They're, they're there witnessing and supporting that with their students and connecting with their families and thinking about what is the role of families and, and learners and their voices toward change. So we finally have a moment as a country where we are starting to listen to those voices in, um, in, uh, in just a greater um, in, in a more earnest way and engage them more actively in how we think about policy making. So, so we think about it as building their muscles, their leadership muscles. I'm interested, you know, in your network about how uh, educators at NEYC use their voice. How do you think about flexing their muscles in your advocacy work? Yeah, it's so interesting if you talk about kind of just leadership being inherent in the profession and, and in the discipline. I, I just were working on a project as part of Power of the Profession with higher education, and I just finished 30 interviews with chancellors and presidents of university systems and, and CEOs of Washington-based higher ed organizations. And one of the common threads around why early childhood education is not invested in, in higher education and why it hasn't become kind of this common professional field is the lack of leadership opportunities, that the perceived lack of growth in the field to, ex to extend your career and to go beyond being in a classroom. And one of many reasons, the actual number one reason was the pay gap. But this notion of leadership is so important. And we actually, when we recently, last, last year, we released the new professional standards and competencies for early childhood educators. There are six of them. And we went through this very lengthy deliberative process to get there. And we're hoping that states just adopt them whole cloth or a large portion of them so that we can have a common professional field of practice in early childhood education. But one of the six standards is on leadership and giving back to your profession and advocacy. So we believe in it so strongly that it's not just when we get around to this, oh, or this interesting kind of, you know, exercise, intellectual exercise, but literally aligned to what you know about science and what you know about math and what you know about child development and language and literacy and social emotional development as important as that pedagogical framework for your profession is a standard on how you engage in, in a leadership capacity and that in, in an advocacy capacity and that in fact joining this profession signing up for the code of ethics compels you in and of itself to do that and we have we've been talking about that more and more i would say over the last five years or so so as a result our public policy conference has grown exponentially. Um, we had 800 people at our virtual policy conference this year in February. Um, we have through all, all work to Lauren and Lucy, Lauren and I joke about Lucy's Rolodex, but can, like you can find any early childhood educator to speak on any, any, anything in the country. And that has really been powerful in the last year um, with the surveys that we've put out because as this crisis was happening, um, we thought what was most important, like what is NACI's wheelhouse in all of this? It is to make sure that at, as we're navigating this pandemic, that we're not just assuming what's happening in the field and we're not just assuming what early childhood educators think or what they want, but real time providing data to policymakers on, on how many, you know, how many layoffs are there? What's happening, you know, women putting um, their payroll on their credit cards to keep their child care centers open, that, that those stories were most important. And so our job is simply to 
make the connections, to create the meetings, to, you know, to create those, um, those relationships, but then to step back and early childhood educators are incredibly compelling. And they, they, as long as that upfront work is done to make the connections, they've got it, like they've got it handled. And so for us to then step back and say, just let the space happen where they can tell their own stories, it's really important. And I think, I don't know, I, I, hope, it's a, I hope it's a sea change, but I think we're starting to see a, a shift in how early childhood educators think about their own power, which is, which is really, really important. So, um, so Roberto, you are currently the nominee, um, President Biden's nominee um, to serve as Assistant Secretary in the Department of Education. Congratulations. Uh, that is absolutely outstanding. We're thrilled for you. Thank and I'm, you. One, I'm wondering if you can share a specific example from this high level. You were also um, in President Obama's uh, administration. That's how we first met. And I'm sure I'm wondering if you can share a specific example of any of the times in these high level roles where you and your colleagues have relied on and responded to educator voice and expertise. Yeah, well, you know, Rian, thank you for the um, congratulations. And uh, I just really appreciate the years of work that we've had together. You and I have collaborated on so many fronts, whether it's, um, you know, doing more to try to invest in improving our early learning workforce or expanding pre-K or supporting greater access to our child care subsidy system uh, to, to kindergarten and to the early grades. So um, I'm just looking forward to continuing to partner with NAEYC in our efforts to really build a stronger uh, and more robust um, early learning system for every single one of our youngest uh, learners. Um, you know, we have always, and I've always really centered educator voice uh, because I think it's essential to how we think about the policy challenges and the designs around the system moving forward. And sometimes that's been uh, easier than others. I, I can think of a couple of different examples, both in the framing of the Every Student Succeeds Act, which you remember President Obama signed into law now over five years ago, but thinking about, you know, the, the voices of our educators and our early educators to support preschool, uh, to support a preschool for all program in that effort, and to think about how we bring about a more well-rounded education and a focus on a more well-rounded education in that law. You know, I remember the voices of our uh, Head Start teachers uh, and, uh, and those in our Head Start centers as we were working on the Head Start for School Readiness Act years ago now in the, um, in the Senate and were uh, really framing that act, you know, alongside our educators, you know, spending time in uh, as legislative aides, um, you know, on both sides of the aisle in our Head Start centers, learning more about, um, you know, how to how to really refresh and, and revise that law so that it worked well for uh, our children and families. So it's just an important imperative, you know. It, it's something we got, we have to do, uh, and particularly we need to do as we think about what the future of the profession should look like, and the future of our early learning profession. Uh, the future of our K-12 education profession, there is no shortcut. It, you know, we talk a lot about the importance that we wanna bring and focus we wanna bring to equity and to opportunity for all of our learners. We talk about the needs that, we're, that we see and we witness in our communities with our families and our students, but there is no shortcut to investing in building that workforce in building that profession so that it is a strong, and, and that needs to be our North Star uh, in education. That needs to be the first priority that we focus on uh, as a country. Uh, and I think for a long time, we've kind of danced around that, but there's no shortcut to investing in the preparation and in the mentorship and in the professional learning and in the support and in the advancement and in the leadership opportunities and potential for our educators to use their voice to frame change. So, uh, you know, I always think about uh, as a policymaker, the importance of setting the table intentionally, right? And there's a lot of, yeah. lot of work that's done to, and I've seen it where it's a check the box exercise of, you know, we'll do a survey and then we'll check the box and we've talked to these teachers or we, you know, have a, 
perfunctory meeting with an organization and then that that is that is teacher voice and we have to set the table the policy making table in different ways right and we have to invite our early learning educators into that table and into that process in a way where they're not just um, invited to sit at that table but they are setting that table with their ideas and their vision for where we go moving forward so i think that is the task at hand not just at the federal level certainly for our for for the biden administration but i think for uh, anybody who is in the in a position of uh, making policy and systems change uh, for our learners Absolutely. And so in thinking about that, you had to think of the top two most important things for policymakers to do in order to facilitate their expertise. What would you say if you're giving advice to folks? What are the top two things that have to happen? Well, I think we need to make sure that uh, we are creating uh, real channels for that level of engagement. And that's not an easy process, again, because um, we do sometimes speak different languages, right? And again, our work at Teach Plus is how do we think about building the, per, the preparation and the fluency of uh, teacher leaders to be able to understand the policy making process and, and advance solutions oriented recommendations there. But I think we need, we need to A, provide the room to set that table in a different way. And then B, I think we need to get serious about marshalling the will and the resources to invest in the profession. And as I said before, I feel like that is something that um, can't be an afterthought. And we haven't had the, uh, uh, as, as serious an effort as we've needed as a country uh, to really take on the investments we need in building and supporting a more robust workforce. I want every young person growing up to be thinking about uh, education and, um, and, and teaching and learning as a viable path, as an exciting path, both to serve their community, but also to grow and and um, and grow and live and experience a robust career. Uh, and so we have a lot of work. We have to get urgent, urgently about that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I would, I, I, you know, when thinking about your top two things, I, it's so interesting because I think it goes hand in hand with. The structures we've set up to deliver early childhood education don't lend itself to early childhood educators having a seat at the table. I mean, when we, when I think about even structurally, like how CCDG is delivered and how, how we say, you know, we're going to pay you provider after the service happens, we're only going to pay you if the child shows up. It just sends this message. We're going to, you know, early childhood educators are earning on average $11 an hour. So everything they're hearing and consuming is that you don't care, that we don't value you. And so even within beyond, beyond having them at the table, which is so important, creating the structure of the policies um, that they that say you are so valuable to us that we are going to create and demand a structure of accountability where you have professional salaries, health insurance, and retirement benefits. I mean, we've done so much polling. We have, we, we ask voters all the time. We know they care about early childhood education, right? Like we know it's a top priority. In a poll we did preparing for power to the profession, they put the value of early childhood educators with firefighters and nurses, like they're heroes. And yet if you act, if you ask early childhood educators how they perceive their value, it's awful. They they be, because there's nothing structurally that happens in their lives that we've created that say, you know, that say, yeah, you can actually feed a family on this salary. You can actually plan on making this a career. We trust you in your practice to make decisions in the classroom. Or there's a leadership. There's an advancement opportunity. There are promotional opportunities. So part of the scratchiness is the difference between kind of how the system is set up and what early childhood educators um, experience, which is so different, I think. And we've got to, I'm counting on you, Roberto, we've got to overcome this. We'll do this together, Rian. <laughs> okay, you know, okay. I, I, remember, I remember sitting together here in Washington, D.C. years ago, you know, at a summit for working families hearing testimony, you know, the sponsored by NAEYC and here and inviting and hearing the testimony of our uh, early childhood workforce to, around the needs for investing uh, in the compensation. I mean, it is unconscionable still that such a large proportion of our workforce can't 
can't afford to put food on their table or to be able to maintain their career without working two, three jobs. And that even carries into the K-12 sector to some degree too, even, even in the later grades. We have to get, we have to get serious about this. Oh, and, totally. um, and, and I Lauren, believe we can. Absolutely. Lauren is giving us the hip hook, Roberto. So we were just a warm up act. There's an amazing group of folks yeah. um, here to present for the rest of the webinar. So uh, thank you so much, Roberto. And Lauren, we thank will you. turn it over to you. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you, Roberto. It was, uh, we loved how you both talked about agency and autonomy, how we ended and started with professional compensation as we all do, because we all know the best way policymakers fundamentally can show their respect for early childhood educators is to create and finance an early childhood system that compensates them for the complex and valuable work they do, regardless of the setting in which they do it, inclusive of centers and family childcare homes and schools. And I think what we're talking about today is these policies that need to be constructed, that need to be influenced by educators how the compensation is structured, how it gets to educators, how the funding is allocated, that those on the ground have the best insight for saying, how do we set up higher education structures so that I can access them from where I am? How do we get the funding, the mechanisms for getting to the, to the field? We're excited to see you land at the Department of Education, Roberto, and we know you'll be anxious as you and your colleagues craft and influence policy to hear from educators, exactly like the ones we're about to hear from today. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Lucy Recio from NAYC, who is going to talk with Megan Hillegas and Nicole Lazarte about their leadership journeys as powerful educators who advocate. Thanks so much, Lauren. And thank you so much, Rian and Roberto, for that wonderful conversation. And I am so excited to now be joined by Nicole and Megan and to talk a little bit about what is that process of advocating. And I think to uh, Roberto's point about intentionally setting the table from your perspectives to talk through your individual journeys as advocates. And so, um, Megan, let's start with you. And um, um, when you, you know, answer my question, I'd love for you to also share with everyone all of the many hats and roles that you done uh, in this space. But I know that you've worked with your school and district leadership, particularly around questions of play in the early grades, right? Something that we know comes up continuously and is always right for advocacy. And so as you think about that, what are the primary obstacles you've encountered? And then what are some of the specific supports you needed or benefited from, which help you overcome those obstacles as you progress through your advocacy journey? So I'm a bilingual early childhood special education teacher. Um, and when I first started in advocacy, I think the hardest part about it was narrowing my focus and knowing where to begin. There were these issues that are so big and so complex, right? Play in kindergarten. Um, and, and where do I begin as an advocate? And so as, as a Teach Plus fellow, I learned to first look at the root causes of this problem. Why aren't children playing in kindergarten? And look at which of those root causes can I have some influence over? There are some that I just had to automatically eliminate, but there were some spaces where I could focus some of my energy. And so from that space, um, I looked for an entry point. What, what piece can I tackle and from what angle can I do it? And as a Teach Plus fellow, we were working um, on a statewide level with kindergarten teachers and we were elevating their voices and surveying them across the state and their experiences using this state mandated kindergarten observation readiness tool. And it was a play-based evaluation tool. And in talking to teachers, we learned that two thirds of them were doing little or no play in kindergarten at all, despite the fact that the state mandated tool was a play-based tool. So that was our entry point, right? We have to do this tool. Two thirds of teachers were not using any play or very, very little. And most of them were saying it was because administration wouldn't let them. And so, so that helped us sort of identify that entry point for talking about play in a productive way. And I think the other thing that was really helpful was to come with all the advocacy that I've done with a, a solutions oriented perspective. It's easy to state what the problems are, but when you start that conversation with your solutions, when you've looked at what possible roadblocks might be and you've identified solutions for those roadblocks, 
it's going to be a much more productive conversation when you come to that table and you make your ask and you already have those solutions um, ready to cover for all the roadblocks that the policymakers uh, might bring up in a way that you make it seem like you're solving their problems also, not just your own. I love that because in a lot of ways, you know, especially this addressing the root causes, I've often heard in many of the conversations I've had with members of the fields that it feels at times overwhelming because there are so many different complexities, so many layers, and so many different challenging points. And I think similar to your experience, Nicole, you have also really focused in on what are some ways that I can address this within my sphere of influence, right? And thinking about your advocacy advocacy journey around engaging with local and state policymakers, and also how do you continue to develop, I think in some ways what we call that pipeline of leadership by supporting fellow educators to advocate as well. So uh, can you also tell us a little bit more about yourself, your journey, and some of the challenges you've encountered, as well as what has worked in order to be able to overcome those obstacles? Yes, of course. So I am an infant teacher. That is my full-time real job. And so I found myself in a classroom where I could only affect the development in the classroom between beyond my four walls, like we keep saying. And so it got to a point where I was realizing there's so many other factors to development, whether it be with their families or with jobs or just funding that comes through the school, that I found myself getting frustrated thinking that I wasn't a good enough teacher. And so that kind of led me to going to my center's board of directors and then going to a senator meeting that came to visit our center. And that was my first time realizing that there is a very big sense of disconnect between educators and politicians. You know, the politicians come with their budgets. They want this, this, and this done. How are you gonna get there? And we as teachers are conditioned pretty much to, you know, do it for the children. Don't do it for the paycheck, do it for the children. And so I realized that unless teachers start speaking up and saying, we're the ones in the classroom and we're the ones that know what's happening, it needs to be done. We, and it's like Roberto and Rianne were talking earlier, we can't let those big decisions on education not be made by educators. And so something that I'm working on is with my Northern Virginia AUIC is creating a cohort where we can bring in these teachers, teach them about these different um, policies that are going on and connect them to experience where they can go and speak up. Wonderful. And I think both of you mentioned this cohort model, this opportunity to be able to do this in partnership with others, to feel supported by different organizations, whether that is Teach Plus, NACI, Northern Virginia, AEYC. As you have gone through this process, um, what has surprised you about being an advocate? Nicole, let's start with you. Again, with that sense of disconnect, all of the meetings are during school hours. I think is something that surprised me also. And at most of the meetings now that I'm going to, I am, if not the only educator in the room and everybody in the room is a director from an organization, people that have these higher up degrees. So it's hard to be that voice of reason when everybody else has such higher credentials. So it's hard to remember or remind yourself that I'm the educator. I've heard that as well. I think especially the challenge around being able to engage in these conversations when they happen during times that are not convenient. So going back to this meaningful engagement, to so setting that table on purpose and ensuring that educators and directors are setting that table, that it's happening during times that are also available and accessible. Uh, Megan, what about for you? What has been the thing that has surprised you the most? I think um, I didn't know how much I didn't know about policy. Um, I'm really good at talking about my practice. Roberto mentioned uh, we have to be bilingual and I speak English and Spanish and uh, I, I did not speak policy. Um, and so I, I really benefited from explicit training on policy and how to talk about policy um, in a meaningful way, in a way that uh, would, would get me listened to. Um, that was, again, sometimes you don't know what you don't know, but I see what a change it made for me and how much more effective I became when I could speak policy. 
Absolutely. And I think that that goes back to something as well, Nicole, that you mentioned, your ability to bring your stories, to bring your expertise from the classroom. But when you're confronted in these rooms with this expectation or these credentials, right, not having that language and that wherewithal um, can be intimidating and can be challenging. And so the ability to be able to make sure that you all are also versed in that language to bolster the experiences you have is really important. So as we think about you know, cultivating more and more educators and teachers to be active and to feel emboldened in this space. What are your hopes and advice for those educators um, as they think about embarking on their advocacy journeys, right, for themselves and for their profession, or to take it up a notch and do a little bit more than what they have up until now? What are your hopes and um, advice, Megan? I would say two things. Um, Lucy, first you mentioned that that Nicole and I both found sort of a cohort. So, so find a mentor, find someone um, who knows about policy, can teach you about policy, wants to learn together with you, a, a friend that's a good listener and also comes from a so solutions oriented perspective. Um, find a, a tribe that you can go on this journey with if you really want to make a change in your school, your district, your state. And I would also say, uh, Roberto also mentioned, you know, setting the table. And that's so important for teachers to be at this table. And we're not always invited. And, and one thing that I learned was um, that sometimes you have to invite yourself. Sometimes you have to come and, and get collect your data and be well informed and get your solutions together and ask to come to the table. And I was always surprised with how many times the answer was, a, okay, sure, you can come. And how many times then that experience opened the door to another advocacy opportunity. So put yourself out there. You absolutely have to know what you're talking about. So do your research ahead of time, but sometimes you have to ask to be included. And I'm very often surprised how often the answer is yes. Absolutely, I love that as well. Right, make your way in if you're not invited. Absolutely love that. What about you, Nicole? What are what would you say your hopes and advice would be? I would say my hope is to retain the teachers that we have in the field. I think a lot of times because we are conditioned to just, you know, keep it going, that we forget that there's no there's no value in us being in the field if we're just gonna keep everything to ourselves and be burnt out in a year or two. You know, people who are in the field want to be in the field. So instead of you know being frustrated with the things that are going wrong it's much easier, not easier, but it makes more sense to go and be part of that discussion and make a change. And I hope that advocacy is more of a route of strengthening educators rather than making them feel weaker and less valued. I absolutely love that. And I do think, you know, to the point of the topic of, of this session, right, how to do this in an intentional, active way, really making sure that as more and more educators and teachers are in this space, that they also feel supported, right, through organizations like NACI, um, our affiliates, as well as Teach Plus, and many others of our partners who are there, who um, I think it's important to remind individuals that there is a community of support that is willing to help you navigate that language, right, to become bilingual. I love that in terms of policy and practice, but the policy space. Um, and that you don't have to do it alone, although sometimes it may feel like you are alone because you are the only person in the room. So uh, to just echo a question that Rian and Roberto asked each other that I would love to ask both of you, what are your top two recommendations for how advocates and policymakers can best support educator leadership? Um, who has a burning desire to start first? Go okay. first. <laughs> Um, so my top two recommendations were one, make the discussions and decisions available and accessible to educators, whether that be on timing, whether that be on location, or like Megan said earlier, just being invited, having it be open and having people be aware that these decisions are being made, and also on connecting with local organizations and finding those advocacy cohorts somewhere that you can connect to not only the information of policies, but also information of where you can go speak up and all those opportunities. Nicole, I love that. What about you, Megan? But mine are very similar to Nicole. I would say to advocates, we, we teachers need training um, in how to talk about policy. We need training in what it looks like, what it means, and how to talk about it. So concrete, practical training so that teachers have that confidence to start to speak up and make a change. And I think also for policymakers, um, we need 
space, make space to talk to teachers. We want to talk to you about our work. Um, I've, I've never filled out so many surveys this year because of COVID. Um, and it was really uh, freeing to hear, like people want to hear about my practice and how it's been influenced by this pandemic. But to me, um, brain development in the first five years of life is just as urgent as COVID. And so I want policymakers to ask me about that too and how we can address it as a field. So I, I hope that policymakers will um, really be intentional, intentional about making a space to talk to teachers regularly about the work they're doing. I love both of those things. And I think that they're, again, once again, really important, right? As we continue to sift through this, and I know that we will transition the conversation uh, as the, to the next part of this discussion, but really, you know, you all have this work, this really valuable and important work that you are doing day in and day out with young children in your classrooms. And yet a lot of the burden, the stress and the weight that you are experiencing, you are able to create an outlet for that through your advocacy, right? And I feel that oftentimes that is what we have to make sure we are doing, that we are creating avenues for individuals to be able to lift up their experiences, to be able to share this with key decision makers, and also to ensure that that is then going to result in action that will impact what is happening in the classroom. And I am so excited and so honored and so privileged to do this work with both of you and so many others um, that really have taken on that challenge of no longer will decisions be made without me or for me, but honestly that I will be leading those conversations and here is what I need in order to make sure that that happens. So thank you so much for this conversation, for your continued advocacy work and for being here today to share this with everyone around how they can better conceptualize what is necessary to ensure that more educators like each of you are, in the, are part of these conversations. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. That was really incredible. Um, I really, Megan, I love this idea of talking in ways so people can hear. It might be because I'm, okay, I'm admittedly rereading this book that I'm sure folks know, How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. And it hit me that this is about talking so policymakers will listen and listening so policymakers will talk about early childhood education. Um, and I know, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a real journey to learn about policy, to have that language, the sense of being bilingual, I love that. Um, I know we've been joined today by educators and directors and advocates, we have staff from organizations, policymakers themselves. I hope everybody who is listening today has been inspired by your journeys and sees, you all see your own roles in facilitating educator leadership in spaces Again, not just sort of theoretically, but super practically. I loved, Nicole, how you talked about hours and days and times of day. I remember like 2000 years ago in 2019 or whenever it was, it was like revolutionary to suggest that educators could provide testimony by video. It was like mind blowing to be like, they could do a video and then send it in so they didn't have to drive to the Capitol, find somebody to fill in their space so that they didn't miss ratio be able to do, like, let's hold on to some of the pieces of the pandemic that <laughs> have shown what's possible in ways to facilitate educator engagement. And so to that end, I really want to turn now to Kim Early from Pennsylvania AEYC. Penn AC and their partners have, in their roles as advocacy organizations, worked extensively to support educator engagement in a specific context. And what we're talking about is the spending of the American Rescue Plan relief dollars and what educators have to say to the state and to their policymakers about how they need these dollars to be spent. So it is my great pleasure to welcome Kim and turn it over to her. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, thanks for the great introduction and thank you for inviting uh, Pennsylvania AUAC to come talk about what we're doing. Um, so Pennsylvania AEYC is one of 10 principal partners of the Start Strong uh, PA campaign, which is a statewide nonpartisan issue advocacy campaign. Um, since its launch in 2019, the campaign has really sought to increase access to high quality, affordable childcare for Pennsylvania children and families and help to protect the Pennsylvania childcare sector from collapse during the pandemic. 
Um, we've done this through state and federal advocacy strategies. And one of those strategies is making the voices of providers, professionals and families heard um, to advocate for change. The experiences and input of providers and families is really critical to our work and has been a significant part of our success as a campaign. Um, and the partner organizations were very intentional, um, even back at the launch of, of the campaign about provider and parent feedback. Um, they asked what they felt worked well, what could be improved about the state's childcare system. And so that feedback was used to help develop um, the, or determine policy initiatives. So right now the campaign is actually considering a more formal structure for families and providers to have a seat at the table as we have a commitment to meaningful engagement um, with those who are most affected by, affected by childcare policy and uh, to increase provider and parent input into our campaign's goals and strategies. So throughout the pandemic, we have really prioritized pr uh, provider and family voice and through those continued conversations, all of the principal partner organizations learned that many of the concerns that they had were not addressed by the state administration. Um, so two of, two of those examples of where they did not feel heard was around under enrollment. Um, so with the CARES Act funding, all, all of the federal dollars that came through to try to stabilize the childcare sector, um, under enrollment uh, wasn't addressed in an equitable way. And another example was the ending of education and retention awards, which were specifically for teachers and directors who you know, are receiving that higher uh, education and credentials. Um, and though that program was around for 17 years, but they eliminated that without public input. So the, those are just two things that we really saw that were not um, addressed by, by the administration. So in addition to wanting to make sure that our efforts uh, reflect the feedback of those directly impacted. Um, it was also critical for Start Strong PA that we get provider and family input on the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, since we knew the administration was not planning to engage them in any uh, meaningful way. So based on the need for that meaningful provider engagement and family input, Start Strong PA decided to hold 12 uh, virtual regional childcare forums in April and May. Uh, and Start Strong PA campaign partners uh, recognize the need for these funds to not only stabilize, stabilize child care providers, but also uh, allow Pennsylvania to think boldly about how we were going to create a stronger, more equitable child care system. So um, the input on the forum will, the input will inform our uh, Start Strong PA recommendations to the administration on the American Rescue Plan Act funds and how uh, those funds should be targeted. So the recommendations will be reflective of the field and, and families uh, suggestions. And that's our hope. And we're actually working on putting the, all of that together right now. And so I guess I'll go into kind of how we are um, doing these, these engagements or how we conducted the engagement sessions um, and how they were set up. Um, the 12 virtual regional forums were split and planned by five of the principal partner organizations where they all took the lead on, or those five took the lead on one to three forums. Um, the organizations were responsible for identifying and, and prepping provider and family panelists, um, which was really important. Um, in addition to getting out the invitations to legislators, so we invited legislators, their staff, we also invited the congressional delegation, um, county commissioners, and uh, grass top leaders, which are um, our non-traditional messengers, like a business leader, chamber of, chamber of commerce, those sorts of folks, to participate as uh, listeners. And then we figured out dates and times pretty much based on panelists' availability. Um, each forum focused on specific counties, so some some forums were you know specific to one county. Um, such as Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia County, or uh, Allegheny County to cover Pittsburgh. But then some of the other forms had more counties. Um, our largest uh, forum included 17 counties, and that was kind of our north uh, or central uh, part of the state. Um, and so we recognized there could be differences in those geographic feedback. So we wanted to, to make sure that we captured that and also to help ensure that there was media coverage, because we also invited the media. 
um, and as well as legislative participation. So the, the forums were held virtually, we used Zoom. Um, they were all an hour and a half in length and we did require folks to register in order to, to participate. Um, individuals could register for really any of the 12 forms um, they, that they wanted to, um, or they could watch the recording and all registrants were encouraged to complete a survey um, that we sent out following the forms. Um, so everyone could, uh, not, those who weren't necessarily participating on the panel um, were able to kind of share uh, their feedback through the survey. Um, we also utilized the chat um, to kind of gather those who weren't on the panel who attended um, live to kind of provide that feedback as well. Um, so that's kind of all the information we're gathering at this point in terms of the information from the survey, the information from the chat, as well as um, the feedback from panelists. Um, after kind of welcoming the panelists, our participants, we made sure to acknowledge the uh, elected officials that, that were able to attend or their staff, thanking them for joining us. We also thank the state administration staff who did um, listen into several of the forums. And then we kind of kicked off the forums by level setting on the federal relief that, that child care programs uh, had received to date in Pennsylvania. So we went through all of that. Um, each form consisted of two panels. Uh, the first panel focused on access and quality, and then the second panel focused on the workforce. And each panel had three to four providers, um, depending on the area and depending on availability. And then we also included, made sure that we included uh, center and home-based providers as well when possible. And we also had a parent on each panel. Um, that was very important that we had the parent voice. Um, the access and quality um, panel focused uh, or was focused on a question that, that was, how should American Rescue Plan funds be used uh, to increase the share of children in high quality programs and support families who need childcare to return to work? So the first panel really answered that. Every, um, each panel, panelist provided opening comments and then we opened it up uh, to the entire panel for further discussion to kind of respond to uh, each other's points or respond to something that was put in the chat. So we had a, a robust discussion, um, which was moderated. And then the second panel followed the same format, but the question was how should American Rescue Plan funds be used to support the childcare workforce? Um, participants who were not panelists were encouraged to use the chat uh, and submit ideas there. And so that was our way to engage them in the conversation. Um, and then we highlighted um, the input from the chat following each panel. So we kind of took a break and then had somebody obviously monitoring the chat and, and sort of lifted up some of those high level um, ideas, whether it be um, someone who echoed or supported what something the panelists said or if they had additional information to provide. Um, we then closed out and thanked everybody for attending, including the elected officials, staff and the administration, um, the media, um, and then we provided the survey link um, so that those folks could continue to provide that information. Um, we also, um, everyone was, who completed the survey then and registered for the event was entered into a drawing for a $100 gift card. So we issued two gift cards per forum. Um, in addition, there were broader links for the survey that was issued to anyone who uh, did not register but also could participate in drawings as well. Um, we had a total of over 600 participants uh, statewide, and so there was an average about, of about 51 people that participated in each forum. Our largest forum was in Allegheny County, which is where Pittsburgh is located. We had 100 participants there. Um, some of the obstacles that we did encounter, um, our first forum was um, Zoom bombed, so we learned from that right away. And so, just you know, if you decide to like replicate this, just uh, and are doing virtual forums, make sure you monitor your registration for any red flags. But we just ended that early and rescheduled it for a later time, so that worked out. Um, in terms of ensuring equity and participation, either by the panelists or those in the chat or um, the survey, we didn't, we were not able to offer the, the forms in other languages, languages other than English. Um, this is definitely an area that we still have work to do and, and want to determine a sort of solution moving forward to either cover costs for translation or something, something of that nature in the future. So we will hey, be, Kim. yes. I just want to thank you so much for sharing all of the detailed information on how yeah. it 
everyone. It was super helpful. And I know you've got some great stuff to drop into the chat. I want to make sure that we get to just our last before we are able to wrap it up for the day. Um, it was awesome work to be able to hear the depth of what happened and how to plan it. And I have another document that I'm going to drop into the chat, which is an article called Flipping the Script, Educators Drive Public Policy, and which called upon educators and policy specialists and makers to change things together. I was very fortunate to write this piece with my friend and then Nacy colleague, Marika Cox Mitchell. And to wrap us up today, I'm pleased to welcome her, the person whose mind I most admire and who's thinking in almost inevitably light years ahead of mine and everybody else's. She's now the Director of Early Learning at the Bainham Family Foundation. Marika, it's all yours. Hi, thanks for including me in this um, important, important conversation. Um, as you've all heard today, um, and as it's pretty clear wherever you are, um, crisis is certainly a catalyst for social change. I think um, we as humans, we kind of want to believe that we just change because we're just good people. We have a moral compass and we're just innately ethical people. But the bottom line is, as we look at some of the um, wins in childcare that we've seen over the years, um, they all were um, facilitated <laughs> and escalated um, by a crisis, whether it's the Defense Housing and Community Facilities and Services Act of 1940, which provided childcare, universal, I mean, universal childcare for us, uh, a subset of women um, during World War II or the war on poverty um, in 1964, or recently the Military Child Care Act of 1989, we know that um, catalysts, I mean, crisis will definitely uh, give us social change and opportunity for social change. Um, and we're seeing that right now, right? The crisis um, we're experiencing right now has given us two things that, um, is, that are necessary for change at this level, um, public awareness. You'll see that the Everybody in the mama essentially is talking about the early childhood issues and the child care crisis we've all been talking about for decades and generations. Um, and we've seen an increase funding. So crisis, increased public awareness, increased public funding, lots of conversation about child care. I think where we need to focus a little bit more as um, the presenters pretty much shared, it's not that change is coming, but who gets to lead the change. And it's imperative that early childhood educators, um, families, those in close proximity to the pain, um, as Ayanna Presley tells us, um, it's also part of the, the decision-making process. They be, they're given the power to, to lead um, and, and transform. And so, I know it's hard for early childhood educators. I'm a trained early childhood educator. I can tell you everything about Piaget and developmentally appropriate practice and how to lay out the classroom and family engagement. Um, when it comes to advocacy, we as early childhood educators are sometimes sort of ill-prepared um, to enter the, the advocacy space for multiple um, factors both um, internal and external. Um, and so I just feel like right now, this is a time for us to um, understand and um, increase our advocacy um, competencies um, like the presenters have um, articulated uh, because lots of transformative decisions are being made um, about, about our work, our work as early childhood um, educators and um, this notion of early childhood educators being just a teacher, just a home care provider, just a center director, just an adjunct faculty, um, and us sort of sitting on the sidelines as others make decisions for us um, has to be disrupted um, significantly if we wanna make some sustainable changes um, to create a more equitable um, childcare system. And philanthropic organizations can certainly um, play a role. I think philanthropic organizations have power, um, particularly in a capitalistic society. I think pretending that we in philanthropy don't is quite harmful. Um, I think what we have to do is know when to yield and wield our power. And um, at the Bainham Family Foundation, we've uh, been having those conversations. We've been examining who we fund um, who do we see as experts? So if we're having a, 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 an agenda that centers early learning, who 
are we funding as the experts to lead that? Um, and we had to definitely over the years expand our portfolio to make sure that um, early childhood educators and organizations that um, are early childhood educators led are a part of the our, our funding portfolio and are elevated and compensated um, as as experts, we can't expect um, early childhood practitioner-led organizations like our local AEYCs or NAEFCC affiliates, our child care aware um, resource and referral agencies, and, and many others to show up um, without giving them the resources like we give other organizations. And so paying attention to who we fund as um, philanthropy, who we elevate as the experts and sort of flatten the hierarchy has been really important for us. Um, and how we fund uh, uh, practitioner-led organizations or educator-led organizations, also really important, um, being equitable with our funding distribution, which means um, we're not being equal and we can all understand the difference between being equitable and, and, and equal with funding. Um, as well as what we fund them to do. And, and again, centering their voices and their expertise and having the experts, the early childhood educators um, lead um, a lot of the, the, the strategy development, the implementation. And so there are lots of big decisions ahead. Um, this crisis is giving us a unique opportunity, um, big decisions around public funding um, who gets it, for what purpose, what is the actual cause of implementing a high quality early learning program? How do we do that in a way that includes um, workforce compensation? Workforce is certainly a big um, topic right now that's being addressed. And again, while we can celebrate the fact that uh, early childhood issues are front um, and center, who gets to make decisions about um, Early childhood is really important and early childhood policy direction, it's, it's really important. Um, so, it's so it's access to quality. Are the families, um, we do the families we support have access to high quality early learning experiences? Um, how are we addressing our childcare deserts? And of course, looking at the, the regulatory conditions as, as well. Um, in many ways, I think I'll quote Lauren on this, uh, this idea of childcare being both overly regulated and underregulated at the same time. I think we have to, um, this provides us an opportunity to um, rethink, um, reimagine. I know you guys are probably tired of hearing about reimagine, but reimagine um, regulations as well. And so lots of conversations are happening. We are front and center, finally. Um, sad that it took a crisis to get us here, but frankly, that seems to be the historical pattern. Um, crisis always sort of gets us significant social change. But the question now is who's leading the, that change? Who's um, being positioned as the expert? Um, and it, it sometimes seems so revolutionary and crazy that the experts in this space will be um, early childhood educators when frankly, in any other industry, the thought of CDC putting out some guidelines without talking to any um, physicians or the, the hotel industry putting some guidelines out without talking to hotel owners um, or the restaurant industry putting forth policies um, that does not include restauranters and, and the staff in, in that industry. It's just such a crazy idea. Um, it shouldn't be that crazy to us for early childhood educators to be position as the expert, um, of course, working alongside other stakeholders and policymakers. And so all to say <laughs> very quickly in the interest of time that this is a unique moment in time and we have to be positioned to um, celebrate the change that's coming, but also be positioned to lead the change. Marika, dropping knowledge and inspiration as always. And the next session will clearly be named something along the lines of like not just Never just, don't ever say you're just an early childhood educator, just in anything, we're not just anything. There is no silver bullet for this, but it is too important to get wrong. So we encourage everybody here to hold us, each other and yourselves accountable for getting it right. On behalf of NAEYC and Teach Plus, including Lindsay Sobel, who wasn't on screen today, but worked diligently to make this happen. 
Thank you to all the panelists, attendees, and everyone for joining us today and stay safe and well. <laughs>